Hello, everybody, and welcome to the premiere episode of Let's Scare Jennifer to Death. I am your host, Jennifer Ann Gordon. I am the author of the Kindle award-winning novel for Best Horror of 2020, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, as well as the Victorian Gothic series The Hotel and the recently released Pretty Ugly. With me today is a person I'm a huge fan of. He is legendary in my mind. It is Mr. Richard Chismar. You may know him from starting and founding Cemetery Dance Magazine. You might know him for being the New York Times bestselling co-author of the Gwendy series with um, a, an up-and-coming author named Stephen King. And, uh, but he's here primarily today to talk about his new release, Chasing the Boogeyman, which as of today just went into its fourth printing. Is that? Yeah. Crazy. It's crazy and amazing. Richard, thank you for being here. Uh, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Chasing the Boogeyman? Sure. Um, you covered a lot of it. I started Cemetery Dance when I was a senior in college at the University of Maryland, way back in the uh, Stone Age of 1988. Um, been doing that ever since, along with the uh, Cemetery Dance book line and, and writing films and, and short stories and, and books. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I write the, the Gwendy series with, with my literary hero and, uh, you know, Stephen King and a lot of other stuff. I wrote a book called Widow's Point with my my oldest son, Billy, that was turned into a movie. Um, so, yeah, I'm a lucky guy, you know, and the new one is called uh, Chasing the Boogeyman. It came out exactly a month ago yesterday. Happy one month and one day book birthday. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, I just I heard from my editor last night that it went into a fourth printing, which is just unbelievable and crazy and unimaginable. So I'm feeling very grateful and uh, excited and, you know, more people will get to read it. There'll be more copies out in the stores and libraries. Um, yeah. It's, it's really exciting. I get really excited when I hear any book goes to multiple printings these days, because to me, that means people are buying a physical book, right? They're going to a bookstore. Hopefully they're buying it. They're treasuring it. They're putting it on their shelves. They're loving it. Um, so congratulations, four printings in one month is, I think, insane. Is that? It, yeah, it is. My my <laughs> my agent keeps calling me rich because I keep saying, I, you know, is this good? You know, when various <laughs> things happen, and uh, I feel like I'd be so neurotic. I'd be like, well, how big were the printings? Was it just like like just? Like, oh, they tell you all that. They tell you, all, and then they put in parentheses, you know, not for public. Uh, yeah, I was going to say I'm not going to ask you what they were. I mean, they're great. I get. You know, they're every week, you know, they're telling me what my sales are. I can see the breakdown between print and I can see the breakdown between, you know, book chains and independence and then uh -huh. uh, audio sales and ebook sales and all that. So they've uh, they've been very happy, um, you know, and I've been, you know, just really happy, like I said, and grateful. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we're a month out and I feel like, uh, you know, they're printing more books. So there's more work to do. To, and to get I I'll say I've not read a book like Chasing the Boogeyman before. And I've read a ton of true crime and I've read a ton of horror, but this book really combines both of those things. Like it's very autobiographical, yet at the same time, all of the horror elements and the true crime elements are fictional. So I, I know your origin story of this, but I right. would like you to tell um, our audience where did the idea for this start? The initial idea for just the storyline came from the fact that there really was a series of home invasions in, in my hometown of Edgewood. And Edgewood is a it's it's a small working class town. It's very blue collar. It's uh, a, a lot of military people because it's surrounded by Aberdeen Proving Ground and Edgewood Arsenal, two, two military bases. Um, you know, my father was retired Air Force and he worked on the uh, at the airfield there. That's how we got to Edgewood when I was four. Um, so in 88, uh, you know, true to the book, you know, when I was just, uh, you know, right after college, there was a series of break ins and uh, the news, the local newspaper um, the, it called the guy who was doing this, uh, the Phantom Fondler. I love that. I mean, it's so <laughs> awful, but and it's so like sensationalist in 1980s journalism. Well, but. that's the thing. You, you almost can't help but giggle when you say it until, you know, until you think about that, how, how terrifying it would be exactly. to wake up with somebody like at the foot of your bed, just like kind of touching your legs or well, that's, whatever. That's what he, was doing. he would, he would, women would wake up and he would be standing or kneeling or sometimes laying down by their bed, oh, no. caressing their hair or their arms or their legs. 
Um, and, and once they woke up, um, you know, startled, he would take off and disappear into the night. And, you know, I've said this a few times, but it, it really hits it for me is, you know, I thought he did this a half a dozen times or so. Um, but when it, when it came time to work on the book and I did some, some research, I found out he did this over 30 times and he was never caught. And that's never caught. I mean, I feel like at some point he is either arrested for something else. Well, I'll cut you off because he was yeah. arrested. Okay. He was arrested in the mid nineties in Baltimore city for an unrelated crime. He admitted to the fondler, the phantom you know, and fondling and, and the evidence they had matched. So they knew okay. he was telling the truth. It wasn't a prank, you know, admission, but uh, he did it over 30 times and wasn't caught for, for that, for those crimes. That scares me so much. And especially, I mean, the serial killers of the seventies and the eighties, they, they racked up numbers like mm -hmm. so many things like oh they broke into houses 50 times and you always wait as like a true crime person like you wait for it to escalate to something so much worse right than just like he just he touched my hair i was petrified but i'm fine into you know you know golden state killer style oh yeah well and that's, where, that's where the book came from i i've uh you know, people said, well, what moment did the light bulb go off? And I just said, well, back then in, in you know, in 88, I remember, you know, I was starting Cemetery Dance. I was immersed in the world, movies, films, you know, books, um, stories. And I remember thinking to myself, what if this escalates? What if it escalates to, you know, rape or murder? And, you know, we, we have this legit serial killer in town and the town had already been undergoing changes, you know, just like I described in the book, there were, there was paranoia. There was, uh, people were buying, you know, extra deadlocks for their doors. Uh, a lot of the time he got in through unlocked doors and windows. So that stopped. Um, you know, I remember people were buying floodlights. Uh, there were rumors that people were buying guns and setting traps outside their houses and things like that. And, uh, yeah, so it, it felt a little bit like all of a sudden I went from being this small press, you know, uh, you know, horror editor of this new magazine and was, you know, writing and submitting my stories and surrounded by the books and posters and that world to starring in like my own version of Scream before it ever existed yeah. because the all the town, screen. Yeah. yeah, the town was on lockdown. So that's where Chasing the Boogeyman came from is, is what if it got worse? Yeah, you know, it's, it's such an unnerving and beautiful book. I will say I live in a very small town now, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And there was one night that I was reading your book over the past week that I thought to myself in bed, I know my door is not locked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know my door is not locked. I have to get out of bed, got out of bed, made sure the door was locked, turned on the light outside, looked at the woods. It's like, yeah. okay, no serial killers out here. Um, so you really got under my skin in a good creep factor, which I loved. Um, that and um, when you talked about the prank phone calls, which I don't think, I hope it's not like too much of a spoiler, but no, you, not at all. you, your character, the character of you, your family, uh, starts receiving hang up calls and prank phone calls. And I will just say this happened to me for years in my late junior high and into my high school years. And we never knew if it was kids that were bullying me, somebody who was supposedly stalking my mother. And I just remember every time the phone ringing, everybody in my house just like going white Yeah. for years. And you captured that. Well, that's the thing. I mean, nowadays, you know, even though you can do, uh, I don't know what it's called, you know, you can like block a number when you call yeah. and make it unknown or, or you know, whatever. Um, you know, back then there was none of that. There was nothing. You had to change your phone number. Exactly. So, and, and you, there, yeah, there was no caller ID. There was no call, but like there was a number eventually you could call in. And it would give eventually you, you could star yeah. 69. And if That's you call it. The yeah, but that was a long time coming. Yeah, but I mean, I still had when this was happening because it was the '80s and '90s a rotary phone, so there mm -hmm. was no star anywhere to be had on that phone. So even if Star Six Nine had existed, it was just you know years of slow brimming terror. Sometimes yeah. three calls a day, sometimes one call a week, sometimes months would go by. Sometimes they would say something, sometimes they wouldn't, and it was just 
it made me petrified of answering the phone. And I feel like to this day, it's probably why I let everything go to voicemail. To voicemail yeah, I'm just like, I'm not picking yeah. that up. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's, that could it's, be a serial killer. It's, it's, you know, it played with, it, it certainly didn't break any new ground and, you know, thematically like that. And I, and I made sure I was upfront with people about that. I said, look, this is kind of like an old campfire story. It's an old fashioned story about, uh, you know, about how, you know, where do you go to be safe? Cause you're supposed to be mm -hmm. safe in, in your house. You're supposed to be safe in your yard. You're supposed to be safe in your neighborhood. And this is just one of those stories that kind of turns that on end. Um, yeah. You know, where you, this is something as simple as the phone ringing, um, yeah. whether it's bright daylight or whether it's night, it, it, yeah, you know, after a while it becomes this jarring thing that you, that you can't help but stop and, and catch your breath. And, you know, it, it's not giving anything away to say that the girls in the book, you know, were purposely taken from close to home, close to safety, or in one case, right from her home. So, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I've always been the guy who, e even as a kid, I always scared my friends. I always locked the doors. I was always careful. I got in my car, I locked the door because I've seen enough movies where, you know, I'm not yeah. the hook guy coming. The hook guy out. is definitely in your backseat. And yeah. sometimes I feel like as a horror writer and a lover of true crime, I feel like every day is just tempting fate. Yeah. Like every like terrible thing I write, I'm like, oh gosh, this is somehow going to like manifest itself and come back to me. Yeah. Hasn't well, happened yet. Knock on wood. But. Well, don't write a book where you make yourself the main character and bad things are happening because then you really feel like you're inviting it. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. was wondering um, how you felt psychologically as yourself as the main character going through something that was obviously much darker than what you went through. Did you ever creep yourself out? Um, writing the book or back then? Writing the book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, that's, and that's the thing. Like I said, I'm, I, I'm that guy, you know, if even now, if I go downstairs, you know, we live in a big 200 year old house and, yeah. and, you know, if I have to go downstairs, you know, if I'm up there settled in bed, reading a book at 11 and I think, Oh, I forgot to get blank and I got to go back downstairs. Yeah. I'm still looking around extra careful. I've always been that guy. Like I said. Um, so yeah, writing the book, there were scenes that, that creeped me out. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's good. That's, you know, that's, that's good. like, I watch scary movies now and my youngest son, no, he doesn't get scared. My wife doesn't get scared. My oldest son and I were terrified yeah. and, we always, and they make fun of us. And we just say, yeah, it's because our imagination is bigger than yours. <laughs> well, I feel that's why I called this show. Let's scare Jennifer to death because mm -hmm. somebody asked me like, why are you calling it that? You're a, you're a horror writer. You love true crime. You love thrillers. You love all of it. Like what scares you? And I'm like, everything mm -hmm. it all scares me i feel like that's why i write it like it's like a self-soothing kind of thing if i write about a haunted house then my house won't be haunted right yeah so, and that, i'm the same i'm still a, that's what i tell people i'm still a believer so yeah you know i'm still that kid who was walking home and you know there really was a myers house uh, that was going know. to be my next question was the myers house um i to me, it very much reminded me of uh, your friend and co-writer Stephen King uh, writing about the house in Salem's Lot, mm -hmm. like the mythical house. The Marston House, yeah. Marston House. Which is terrifying. Which I know, I just say it and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't even say that. So you're Myers House, correct? It was, yeah. it was just and the Myers it, House. Yeah, it's the Myers House. And we used to play football in the backyard and it was separated from the house. It, uh, it had a lot of property, a huge, long front yard. Um, but in the backyard, particularly, we used to play football. It was an open field um, by this apple grove. And it was separated from the house, like I said, by these tall trees. So that helped. But so we weren't scared very often during the day. But at night, and it was the shortcut, just like I talk about in the book, from the shopping center, the library. Um, if we walked to the schools that way, you know, we always took that shortcut. And so walking up that gravel driveway at night was, was terrifying. And, you know, it, it didn't matter how tired we are. We usually all, automatically, all of us started talking more. And at some point I started telling the guy scary stories. And that's, uh, what I always did is I, to try to make myself not scared. I try to scare everybody else. And yeah. Cause if somebody else is more scared than you are, then you're fine. Then you're mm -hmm. the one in control. Right. And I was terrifying myself, too. I mean, and like I said, then we would scream, we would run. And then the next day, you know, we the fear would turn into laughter. And then the next day we'd be like ready to yeah. do it all again. Because nothing's scary during the day. It doesn't seem as scary. In my neighborhood, we had woods and we had to go through the woods because it was the shortcut to get to everybody's house. And we used to hang out in the cemetery. And to get to the cemetery, we had to go through the woods. And right. 
And, you know, we were kids in the 80s and 90s. So, of course, we hung out in the cemetery. We smoked cigarettes. We did everything we weren't supposed to do. Right. Until, you know, back in the day, it was like, just be home before dark. Yes. So we, we would push it like, oh, okay, the street lights are on. That means I'm supposed to be on my way home. But if I take the shortcut through the woods, I can be in my backyard as pitch black happens. So right. we, would, we would push it and then have to do the terrifying walk through the woods of just... Yes. I'm going to be attacked. I'm going it. to be attacked. Like, yep. Why didn't I leave 10 minutes earlier? I could have taken the long way. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that, and that's the thing is I, I think people have asked me, well, what do you think is the key to the book's early popularity after a month? And I, and I, uh, and I mentioned this to you before, um, you know, when I was writing it, there were times when I stopped and I thought, is this book too per, I mean, it's such a personal book. It's such a personal story. And there were times I stopped and I thought, is it too personal? Um, or is it going to connect with readers? And the cool thing that I found out afterwards, and not only just with other people who grew up in Edgewood, but all across the country, um, is that, I, you know, I was actually writing down memories for all of us. Um, a lot of us, a lot of this stuff is, is shared memories. And, and people have said it's either you either lived my childhood and vice versa, or um, you live the childhood I wanted to live. You know, oh, someone who grew gosh. up in, in the Bronx or whatever that, you know, I just talked to a couple of weeks ago. They said that they're like, you know, this is very much how I envisioned living out, you know, from the shows I watched on television, that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, and that was a neat thing. I mean, and, and it was also kind of a bonus that I heard from so many people who grew up in Edgewood, not only, you know, close friends, but just acquaintances and then people who grew up before me and after me. And they're like, oh, yeah, I did all these same things. You know, we did I this, we did that. that. And, and that was a neat kind of revelation for me. I wanted your book to have a map in it. And so what I loved so much about your book is you did everything right as a, as a true crime or fake true crime book. Mm -hmm. uh, the photos, the photo section, like gave me chills. Like I wasn't expecting a photo section and then the photo right. section happened. I'm like, oh, everything's perfect. And I'm like staring at everything. Um, I would have loved a map. I actually thought I almost had there, there's an artist up in Maine named Glenn Chadbourne who does a lot of genre illustrating and he's done a lot of Stephen King books and, and other big writers and uh, he's a great artist and he does these maps and for our we did a, a limited edition of Salem's Lot a couple of years ago and he did a great map of the lot and I actually almost I thought about having him do that as and, and using it as like on one of the photo pages. And then I thought, you know, we'll wait. And if there's a limited edition say for a limited edition, that would be outstanding. Yeah, either a fold out or I can I can have it be the, you know, the the end papers in the front of the book and the oh, end. Of the book. Yes. Um, I, I thought the same thing because it, it'd be neat to number one. I love those kind of like little maps. Yeah. I always have. Um, and it would be neat to kind of show people, that, you know, this is. You know, it's one thing to tell them that, you know, Hanson Road and Edgewood Road bisect. And here's yeah. the shopping center. So if you come up by this Myers house, then through the backyards of this next row of houses, you're on Tupelo, which leads right down yeah. to the Hanson's, which, I, which is where I live. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to show them. And I would. Yeah. So people can look at it and be like, oh, it really is right there. Of course, they right. have to take that shortcut. And that was the point of the photos is just to yeah. kind of give someone a that immediate, you know, um, visual connection. It was great. Is it? Um, you know, who you got to take the photos and the staging of the photos is it's very authentically 80s. Like right. the, the hair is perfect, like just great job on the casting, whoever yeah, <laughs> hired those it, people. It, that was either Billy and myself or uh, a local pro a production company that does great work and, and they've done, uh, they've, they've worked on a few movies for us and, and they really do good work. Um, but we had fun doing those. And I love the fact that the book, you know, we didn't advertise it on the outside because I wanted it to surprise people. And I love the fact that, you know, they got to chap end of chapter one and then all of a sudden they got to see the house I grew up in. That yes. I they got to see the library. They got to see the Myers house. Um, and that's one thing. And then they get to chapter two and they start reading about the first victim and to see her, the yeah, her. you get to see her face and you get to see her on a little skateboard. I know, I can say like the innocence of those, like the teenage photos of, you know, life before the internet, life before cell phones, just like there, there was such a beautiful nostalgia factor there and it was so bittersweet. Um, and yes, I was thrilled that there were photos because the photos are usually my favorite part of a true crime book. Because well, like you get to that point and you're like, oh, I wonder 
if there's photos of that like interview when he's in jail and you're like, yes, mm -hmm. there is. He does well, look like a psycho. And that's why that's why I did it because when I when I read true crime and I'm a longtime true crime fan, I, I I'm with you. I I the, I'm always especially fascinated by the photo section, and I'm usually bummed because it's usually not long enough. It's usually no you know, anywhere from four to maybe ten pages in the middle. And of it's the, yeah, I was gonna say it's smack dab in the middle of the book. So like, and, I, and yeah. I'm always flipping back and forth. Flipping because back and I forth, read like, about, then I break all the spines of every true crime <laughs> book because like I'm like back and forth so many times. Yeah, and I like. I, for me, that that's always helps the story hit home because I read, I do read so much fiction and I read history and I read a lot of other things. But when I'm reading true crime, you know, you're reading about these real people. Yeah. And I, I always say, I think it takes a lot of courage to write true crime and to allow, you know, your story to be written about um, yeah. the, the amount of kind of compassion and understanding and, and just the weight that it carries. Uh, you know, I admire those writers. And, and the amount of research they do and all that. And I've always thought about, maybe one day I'll, you know, I'll do a true crime book. And then I think about all his hours of research and how yeah, you know, yeah, I thought the same thing. Something. And then I thought, I'll make like, it up. Yeah. You like, do that in a true crime book. And I, like, and with a true crime book, there is so much responsibility mm -hmm. to the, each of the victims. And yeah. that is like, as a, as a writer, it's like, that is a lot of weight to bear. And I said this, I, I was being interviewed on a radio show the other day and they said, oh, would you ever write a true crime book? Cause you love it. And I was like, I don't think I could. I think it would be easier to make one up because. Well, it is, trust me, <laughs> it is, you know, and, and, and even though you want your, you know, your, your research to appear factual, it's just, you know, it, it's just, I, I can't fathom what they do. And no, uh, it's years of time. It's those years pictures, of time. I find myself just drawn to them and more times than not, it's just the, like it's often like the simplicity of the crime scenes, you know, yeah. uh, for people who don't know, it's usually not gory. It's usually not, you know, sometimes you see blood stains or you see, you know, a, a sheet over. But most of the time, you you know, you're looking at this little wooded area behind a shed. Yeah. Or, and like a bunch of cops who just look like they're like they've got no hope in the world. Like yeah. already at that moment, you see the supporting cast of characters right. and they're like beaten down and broken. Mm hmm. Yeah. Or you see how you see, you know, one of the investigating officers uh, initially, you know, early in the story. And then there's another photograph of him five years later. And the guy looks 15 years older. Yeah. It's like um, the, he, they age like presidents do. It's like, really? It was only four years. He looks terrible. Yeah. So yes. we had we had fun with the pictures, as weird as that sounds, because of what the subject matter is. You know, and we tried to keep telling, you know, especially Billy and I, we kind of we tried to keep saying, you know, don't be too uh, sensational. You know, yeah. the, most of the time the pictures aren't like that in the book. So yeah. you want this to appear as, re as real as possible. So sometimes you're just showing, you know, like there was a picture of a detective walking along these rocks under a stone bridge. And it's like, that's yes. what you see. It, yes, be, it be, you know, you're perfect. so tempted to do something else. You know, you're so tempted. Like I really wanted to have the picture. Uh, and again, I don't think this is a spoiler, but um I, I, we planned all along of shooting the picture of, of uh, the boogeyman being captured on film on Halloween night by that mom. Um, and to me, it would have been the scariest picture in the book. You know, the innocent two little trick or treaters, the mom shooting it. And then across the street, you can see this kind of yeah. Michael Myers like figure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it never, I'm getting worked, chills. Out. I'm it getting never chills. worked out. So I'm sort of glad it didn't because I think it's, it, then it can be anything in your imagination. Mm -hmm. And that was like, for me, one of the scariest moments in the book because I was like, oh my God, it's him, it's him, it's him. I know it's him. And that's, <laughs> that was the point I was going to make is that, you know, I, as much as I would have loved to have shot it and personally seen it, um, I, I think probably it was better that because that picture would have stolen all the attention from the others. And and at the same time, it would have been, you know, it, it's enough that, that, the, that the, you know, the law, uh, you know, officers, the police officers actually got that picture. Um, we didn't have to, like you said, we didn't have to show didn't it. Have to show I it. would have liked to shoot it and frame it. Put it. In I my was going to say, I, I, I want that photo for you to have it, like on yeah. your desk. Like this is my fake murder suspect photo. Maybe we'll take it for the limited. For the limited edition, yeah. yeah. Like just write these down. Like Jennifer's ideas. Got to have yeah. a map. Got to have the killer photo. I love the map. The map. The map. I was in a writing class couple weeks ago and the writing prompt was draw a map based on like an emotional memory you have like the map of the place that it happened and it can be ridiculous and then write a little piece about it 
And I, re- I drew my neighborhood and I just remember like drawing the woods and being like too scared to go in at night, drawing the cemetery and being like, this is where I, you know, smoke pot the first time, <laughs> like drew like these random like stray dogs that I was scared of on like the back street. That was also a shortcut to everywhere. I'm like stray dogs. They lived here. <laughs> I, I, I wrote about maps in, uh, in Boogeyman with my, my best friend, Jimmy Cavanaugh, who was featured in the book. He was a real person who lives down in South Carolina. I love that. Uh, and I used to draw those maps and I'd hide uh, I'd hide the, the foreign coins that my father, uh, he always, because he traveled a lot when he was in the Air Force. So he had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, foreign coins that he would give us kids. And uh, I remember hiding them, you know, burying them various places in the yard. And then I would draw these maps and I would pretend like I found them. <laughs> and, and Jimmy will tell you that, you know, he might have fallen for it the first time or two, but the rest of the time he would roll his eyes and he's like, of course I knew it was you. And I'm thinking back to when we were kids. I'm thinking, I think I had you the whole time. Yeah, you probably did. You know how to tell a story. You know how but, to make a good tale. Yeah, to me, maps are neat, they're this neat kind of, you know, connection uh, to, uh, to, well, to to whatever you want, whatever you're drawing the map yeah. for. but. Yeah, you're right. I'll have to. I'll have to. If we, if there's ever a limited, I'll have to squeeze in. I have to. Yes, yes. For me, I would buy what I would buy that several times, just (laughs) so I could, you know, read one and put one on the shelf forever. Yes. Uh, Before we end, um, I do have to ask Stephen King. Does that still feel unreal to you, or is it like have you chilled into the fact that you guys are friends and write together? Because I know. Um you Both. he was like your idol yeah no I, I i just i tweeted that yesterday uh somebody well several um people posted about it being the 35th anniversary of it and i i, I remember I, I did the quote tweet or whatever or retweet where I, and i said this book changed my life um and even before that with with his short story the monkey that uh, my 11th grade English teacher brought into class and we read it out loud. And oh you know, those are the two moments where I just knew I was like, Oh, you know, this is, this is like being a magician, you know, yeah. being able to do this to people. And, uh, and then, you know, to, to grow up and I'm, to be able to publish them and then have a business relationship yeah. to a friendship. So yeah, the, the, the long winded answer to your question is it's a little bit of both still. Um, we're friends. So, you know, he texted me a couple of hours ago, the, a, a cool graphic. And, and he was talking about how he used to go see these movies when he was 12. And, you know, I, I asked him, I said, how much, what was admission? He's like 35 cents. Um, so yeah, we're friends, you know, and I can text mm-hmm. him later tonight and say, you know, the breaking news, the Baltimore Orioles still suck and he'll <laughs> take emoji. And so it's very much like a friendship with any of the other guys I've grown up with. Um, you know, very complicated. That's incredible. I uh, love hearing that. He is, you know, of course, as any horror author, he is one of my idols. I don't think I would be a horror writer today if I didn't sneak a copy of Pet Cemetery out of my uncle's room at the age of 10 mm. and and read it secretly, like hiding behind my dollhouse. And I just remember thinking, whatever this is, this is what I want to write. Yeah. I want people to be scared and sad at the same time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was just I mean, like, that's I, what I want. I had fallen in love with it really early with, you know, just the recognition that, you know, my favorite part of Wizard of Oz was the part where I was scared, yes. you know, with the flying monkeys and the witch and my favorite, you know, I loved those, you know, I had three older sisters. So I watched everything, you know, like I remember Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. My favorite part was being terrified of the child napper with the net. <laughs> and, and then, you know, the Abbott Costello, you know, meets the mummy and Frankenstein and all oh. those things. And then Twilight like- Zone. The ghost of Mr. Chicken. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, ghost of Mr. Chicken and I, I think the incredible Mr. Limpet. When oh, he, like, I, I have seen the incredible Lim- Mr. Limpet probably more times than anyone on earth. And- I was like, I loved it and I was so petrified of it. Mm-hmm. That and also the incredible shrinking man I remember mm-hmm. I saw when I was a kid and it caused me to be obsessed with the fact that I too had been misted by water on a boat recently. So I measured myself every day for like six months, just like waiting to shrink. Yeah. So you were a believer like me. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then when I did, you know, Salem's lot and, and Stephen King and then the rest of them, it just, it, what he showed me was uh, what he says, Richard Matheson showed him is that it didn't have to be, you know, horror in a castle or in a faraway land right. or, in this, you know, in a scenario that I really had to kind of stretch my imagination to, to believe in, it could happen in my neighborhood or in a small town, you know, and, and that's, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, so yeah, I, I'm still 
there's still times when I will, you know, I'll walk by and I'll see Gwendy on a bookshelf or something. And I'm like, yeah, that happened. And that's, that happened. That's your crazy. name on there. With yeah. And, and people you know, will say what's next. And I'm like, well, the next Gwendy book comes out in February. And I'm like, yeah. So no matter what, and it's not, I don't say it to him anymore. You know, I'm not like, like I love you so much, bro. Thank well, the you. one I always, the comparison I always say was the old Saturday Night Live with Chris Farley and Paul McCartney, where Chris Farley kind of just sits there and every once in a while he stammers. Did so, you remember the Beatles? <laughs> yeah. You know, and he's got the smile and he's squirming, and it's like, you know, I'm past that stage of being like, so remember when you wrote Carrie? Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I mean, I've exp I've explained it to him before. I'm like, look, no matter how. No matter how, you know how many baseball games we see, or or you know whether we write something else together or not, or you know all that stuff, there's still that factor of look. You know, I'm I'm always, you know, in awe of of the guy personally and professionally, and just totally, you know, gobsmacked and and extremely grateful that that you know I've been allowed to be a part of his world. So yeah, it's it's a little of both. Well, I love that. And that's a wonderful way to end today and my very first episode of Let's Scare Jennifer to Death. Richard, you've been awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, first, I'm honored. First, first episode. I was just like, I wanted to go big for my first episode. So yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, everyone who is tuning in now or on the replay, stay tuned next month when I have best-selling true crime author Alan Warren talking about his new book, Killer Queens. I want to thank Roman Saratin, our producer. I want to thank Pam Stack, our executive producer, everybody at the Global Authors on the Air Radio Network. This has been a copywritten podcast from the Global Authors on the Air Radio Network, and I will see you all next month.